السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونستهديه ونعوذ بالله تعالى من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن سيدنا وحبيبنا وأسوتنا وقائدنا محمد عبده ورسوله اللهم صل وسلم وبارك على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله الطيبين الطاهرين وأصحابه أجمعين وعلى كل من تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا علما سبحانك اللهم لا علم لنا إلا ما علمتنا إنك أنت العليم الحكيم اللهم أرنا الحق حقا وارزقنا اتباعه وأرنا الباطل باطلا وارزقنا اجتنابه وبعد Special brothers and sisters Alhamdulillah <clears throat> All praise for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala It's a pleasure to be here and an honor to be here in Newcastle. This is the first time I've actually come to Newcastle to give a talk. I did come once a long time ago, a long, long time ago, but uh, in terms of giving a talk, this is the first time. And Newcastle normally is out of the way. For us, it's not even in England, it's not even in Scotland. We don't know where it is. Somewhere in the middle. We, we call it, it's in the A'raf In the Barzakh, not the A'raf, sorry, but the Barzakh You know the Barzakh is Al-Hijab Between two things Barzakh is the life which is between Hellfire and Paradise I'm not going to say which one is Hellfire and Paradise But it's in the middle So we don't really know where it is And it's out of the way And we, know, we don't normally travel to Newcastle So Alhamdulillah when Brother Abdurrahman Invited me and invited us to come uh, I thought it's a good opportunity to come to Newcastle and inshallah we pray Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accepts this effort, this endeavor of organizing this event. Um, the topic normally pulls the crowd, especially more sisters than the brothers. This is normally the case everywhere that I go. Um, marriage is a very important topic. Like all the topics of Islam, and we all know Islam is a moderate religion. Islam is a religion that's balanced. It's the teachings of Islam are quite balanced. When we say balanced, they are in between the extremes found in all the various different faiths and religions. It's the, that's why we say in salat al-mustaqim. Allah guides us to the straight path, the direct, the middle way, the, the balanced path, which is the The path which is in the middle, which is the middle way, the balanced way which is in between the two extremes. Therefore, all the teachings of Islam, from our aqidah, from our belief, to the way we pray, zakat, charity, and all the rules of business and trade and marriage and inheritance, as you know, Islam is a complete way of life. It's not just a religion that we carry out certain modes and forms of worship. It's, it's a complete way of life. So all the teachings of Islam are balanced. And marriage is no different. The way Islam looks at a nikah wa ziwaj, the, the perspective of Islam, the guidance of the Quran and Sunnah in regards to marriage, very balanced. The approach of Islam to marriage is a very moderate approach. What is that approach? It's between two extremes. One extreme you have in certain faith communities is where marriage is considered to be any, any form of um, fulfilling of one's desires and needs is considered to be wrong, sinful, evil. It, it's totally wrong in some faiths. That's why in order for an individual to become a pious, righteous, practicing Mus- uh, believer, not a Muslim in those faiths, a practicing believer, someone who who wants to or desires to become devout, someone who wants to attain closeness to God, someone who wants to attain proximity to God, in order to become righteous and devout, in some faiths, you have to live a life of celibacy. You have to live a life of celibacy. We have the nuns who don't marry all their lives, and we have the bishops who don't marry, and, and you know the popes and marry, and all of that. A lot of them, the archbishops and the bishops, 
because that's their approach to marriage. Because fulfilling of one's desires, there's no right way to it. They consider it to be wrong, evil, something filthy, dirty. There's no correct or there's no right way of fulfilling one's human, uh, human desires, the desires of the human being. So any, anything con- connected to marriage, anything to do with fulfilling one's sexual needs and desires, it's considered to be wrong. And that's why they live a life of celibacy. Their understanding and approach is that in order for a person to become pious and righteous and godly and devout, they must live a life of celibacy. That's one extreme. We have another extreme on the left, which is that there are no restrictions. You fulfill your desires in any way, shape or form you want. In any way, whether through a halal way or a haram way, whether in a lawful manner, whether in an unlawful manner. Whether with, you know, through marriage or through fornication, adultery or zina. And then there are no limits. The extreme goes to the far extreme where people fulfill their desires with whoever, whenever, whatever. I say whatever in this day and age. You know, and that's where we have homosexuality and all these things come up. It's just fulfilling, there's no restrictions, there are no hudud, no limits. Do you understand what I'm saying? There are no hudud. Islam takes the middle balanced way, the middle approach. That the extreme of living a life of celibacy, which is called sarura. There's a hadith of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, recorded in the Sunnah of Imam Abu Dawood, where he said, the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, La sarura fi Islam. The word sarura, there's two meanings. But one of the meanings of the word sarura is, there is no celibacy in Islam. Islam does not encourage Islam does not encourage living a life of celibacy. Islam says get married. It's actually an act of ibadah, worshipping Allah. So the middle approach is that there is no celibacy. Fulfilling one's desire, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, our Lord and Creator, created us. He knows humans better than humans know themselves. He knows us better than we know our own selves. And it's absolutely natural and normal. It's part of one's fitrah. To get married and fulfill the desires. And to go against that is actually, it's actually challenging the fitrah, the natural disposition, the natural uh, um, disposition and the fitrah, the nature upon which Allah created human being. So if you go against that, then you're challenging the fitrah. And that's why what happens? You can never live a life of celibacy. Even those who say we want to become godly and devout, we have to live a life of celibacy. What happens? We all know what happens. The stories are all the time in the news. That this person did this and this person did that. The ones who, who try to live a life of celibacy. They don't marry all, life, all, all their lives, but things happen. You know what I'm talking about, right? I don't need to be explicit. So, this is, this is extreme. Islam says that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created us. He knows us better. He knows us best. This is the nature, this is the fitrah of the human being. That um, he needs, a, or she needs, a human needs to fulfill their needs in a rightful way. But at the same time, on the other hand, there are limits. There are hudud. There are limits. And the limits are such that you need to have a marriage. It needs to be done in the right way. It needs to be done with commitment. There are rights and there are responsibilities. There are hukuk, rights of the husband, rights of the wife. So this is the middle, middle approach that Islam takes with regards to marriage. And this is why, as I said, the hadith of the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, la sarurata fil Islam. There is no celibacy in Islam. Islam, all the prophets of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala besides two, all of them married. It's actually a sunnah of not just the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, but it's a sunnah of, of all the prophets of Allah. Or except two. There's only two prophets who did not marry. You know who they are? Who are they? Anybody? Yeah. Then that's number one. Jazakallah. Isa, alayhi salatu wasalam, peace be upon him. Jesus, as they call him. That's one prophet who actually, our aqidah, our belief is he will return and then he shall marry and have children upon his return. 
And another prophet is Sayyiduna Yahya, peace be upon him. Allah says, wa Sayyidan, wa Hasuran, wa Nabiya min al-Salihin. Besides these two prophets, وَلَقَدْ أَرْسَلْنَا رُسُلًا مِنْ قَبْلِكَ وَجَعَلْنَا لَهُمْ أَزْوَاجًا وَذُرِّيًا All the prophets we sent, not just we married them, we married them off and also وَجَعَلْنَا لَهُمْ أَزْوَاجًا We appointed wives and spouses for them and children, ذُرِّيًا Family, they had family. So all the prophets. And this is what Islam considers marriage to be an act of ibadah. An act of worship. Marriage is what? This is the problem, unfortunately, in our communities. We think marriage is a worldly thing. It's, a, it's, it's, it's something to do with our culture. Islam does not look at marriage as a mundane worldly activity. It's an ibadah. Do we think about that? Marriage is what? There's no difference between salah, yaqadah, salah, and marriage. It's an ibadah, worshipping Allah. It's a means of attaining proximity to Allah. It's not a worldly thing. It's not just to fulfill desires and that's it. It's actually an act of ibadah, worshipping Allah. It's a spiritual part of our life. And that's what we need to be forget to realize this. We think it's part of... And that's why what happens in our marriage ceremonies, in our... Because we think it's, our, it's to do with our personal life. For a Muslim, there's no personal and, and religious life. Everything is religious. A to Z of our lives need to revolve around Islam. From A to Z for a Muslim. But we think it's part of our culture. So we'll have all the different cultures carrying out their marriage ceremony in a way of their culture. And then sins are committed. And it's considered to be a normal, just a worldly activity. A mundane worldly activity. And people, there are people who are far away distant from Islam but when the time of marriage comes they, they just visit the mosque as part of the culture it's just a culture whereas the psalm says it's an act of ibadah marriage is worshipping Allah it's an act of ibadah it's a sunnah of the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam once hadith of Sahih al-Bukhari and elsewhere a famous hadith where he addressed the youth and he said ya mahshar al-shabab man istata'a minkum ul-ba'ata falyat al-zawmaj فَإِنَّهُ أَغَضُّ لِلْبَصَرِ وَأَحْسَنُ لِلْفَرَجِ وَمَنْ لَمْ يَسْتَطِعْ فَعَلِيهِ بِالصَّوْمِ فَإِنَّهُ لَهُ هِجَاءٍ He was addressing the youth and he said, sometimes he used to have a youth program and he would address the youth. Sometimes he would just address the women. The congregation were just women. So in this instance, the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam addressing the young people, he said, O oh, group of young people, whoever amongst you is able and capable of marrying, فَلْيَتَزَوَّجْ let him marry. He should marry. She should marry. Whoever is capable, marry. Don't delay it. Because it preserves your eyesight. It guards your modesty. It gives you chastity in your life. It makes you a, a, a good, righteous Muslim. فَإِنَّهُ أَغَضُّ لِلْبَصَرُ وَأَحْسَنُ لِلْفَرَجِ And then, وَمَنْ لَمْ يَسْتَطِعْ Whoever is not capable or able to marry because of certain reasons, or maybe for the time being, somebody is not able because he is not financially in a position to marry. And the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa says, فَعَلَيْهِ بِالصَّوْمِ He should fast. Because fasting acts as a shield for him. And this, this hadith requires a lot of commentary. But the point here is that marriage is considered to be an ibadah, a form of worshipping Allah. I'm happy that Allah stands here. So we need to remember, brothers and sisters, Marriage is an act of ibadah. It's an act of worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay, this is a very important point we need to remember. Remember this point. A lot of people forget marriage is an act of ibadah. One of the imams of the ummah, he says that there's only one, he says there's only two, but rather one, acts of worship that have been prescribed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from the day he created the world from the time of Adam alayhi salatu wasalam till the time of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wasallam until the next life and even in paradise. There's no act of worship that will remain until the next life. Salah, we pray in this life and then in the next life there is no prayer unless you want to voluntarily pray. But normally, generally, there's no salah, there's no zakah, there's no hajj. There's only one act of worship prescribed from Adam alayhi salatu wasalam till the time of the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wasallam till 
The next life, even in Jannah, even in paradise, people will marry. It's an act of ibadah, we should remain even in the next life. So it's an act of ibadah. And this is the reason why. Because it's an act of ibadah, the whole marriage ceremony, and this is what I want to really focus upon, the whole marriage ceremony, and everything related to marriage has to be in the spirit of it being an ibadah. It's being a sunnah of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. A to Z. And that's why if you look in the marriage ceremony, remember it's an act of ibadah, like you're offering salah. In the marriage ceremony, when people go to the masjid, or whenever you have the marriage ceremony, the imam who conducts the marriage contract, he recites the khutbah, the sermon, called the khutbah al hajj It's a famous khutbah. This is the sunnah of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. After which, in which, after praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and sending blessings on the Messenger of Allah, there are three verses recited. How many verses are recited? Three verses. After which you can read many hadiths of the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But the sunnah is to recite three verses from the Qur'an. Those of you who are married, you probably know those verses. Unfortunately, we have people who marry, they've gone through the, the marriage ceremony, they still don't have a clue what the verses are about. You see, this is the problem because for many of us, Islam is just a cultural thing. Because I was born in a Bangladeshi or a Pakistani or a Gujarat Indian or an Arab or a Somalian family, it's just, okay, I'm a Muslim by, by chance, by accident. Okay, you know, whatever happens in the family, marriage happens, okay, what, what happens, people go to the masjid, and then this happens, that happens. Every culture's got their own kind of marriage ceremony. It's more of a cultural thing than an Islamic thing. And this is a big problem in our societies and our communities. Because our, we, many of us, especially the born Muslims, are Muslims because of, like some of them are just by chance, by accident. I've actually met young people who say, really, we don't, I don't really know what Islam is. Tell the truth. If, I, tell you, if you ask me if I really, really believe, I don't really know. I don't know what's going on. It's just, I was born in a Pakistani family. My parents are Muslim. That's it. Things happen. You know, the way my brother got married, they go to the mosque. You know, Ramadan comes, iftar, suhoor. It's food. It's a cultural food. People get together, nice celebration, eat. You know, it's a problem. Seriously, because we point fingers sometimes at the Christians that these people are atheists, really. You know, a lot of the time we say, oh, these people, they don't really believe. They just by, you know, by name they are Christians. They don't really believe. How many of us are truly Muslims? We say they celebrate Christmas. Many of Muslims, so-called Muslims, the only time they're Muslims is when Ramadan comes and Eid comes. Celebration of Eid is like, it's like a cultural festival more than a religious festival. In Islam, Eid is a religious celebration. It's more to do with spiritual celebration than external celebration. Eid is when you worship Allah in the middle of the night. You know, Laylatul Ja'izah. That's what Eid is about. And then you go to the first thing in the masjid, first thing in the morning, you know, with the sunnah. It's, it's a it's religious celebration. You can have some external celebration. But that, if, if a person is offering, is, is celebrating Eid and not offering the Dhuhr, Asr, Maghrib, Isha on Eid day, there's no celebration. If you do not offer, if I do not offer, if we do not offer our five time prayers on Eid day, there is no Eid celebration. That's like someone who's an atheist, like the Christians, who just happens to go to the midnight mass they have, and that's it. And then just do whatever they want all day long, since it's there's no use in coming and offering Eid prayer. You know Eid Salah, for example, I know this is off topic and I'm going to go back to my topic. But you know Eid Salah, you know what the ruling for Eid Salah is? What is the ruling? There are some ulama here sitting, but I'm not going to ask the ulama because that's just disrespectful. Those who are not scholars. What's the ruling? Like, is it far? Is it wajib? Is it sunnah? What is it? It's wajib. Okay. What's Fajr Salah? What's Zahar Salah? What's Asr? Eid Salah, actually, there's two opinions. The mainstream the majority opinion, especially the Hanafi opinion, it's that it's wajib. According to some schools of thought, like Imam Shafi'i, Imam Ahmed bin Hamdan, Imam Malik, it's sunnah. Sunnatul mu'akkada, emphasize sunnah. Some say it's sunnah. Eid salah is sunnah. Dhuhr is farb. You rather pray the dhuhr and not pray Eid salah if you were going to choose between the two. You rather pray Asr, Maghrib, Isha and not offer the Eid salah if you were choosing between the two. But for a Muslim to think, not go for Eid Salah, it's a... Why, why are you then going for Eid Salah and not going for Dhuhr? Because 
A lot of people come there wearing nice clothes. It's that, that becomes a cultural celebration rather than a religious celebration. If you were religiously happy, if you were celebrating from a religious perspective, you'd be going for Dhuhr Salah and Asr more than Eid Salah. But because it's a cultural thing, you go for Eid Salah because now people are meeting, yes, food, afternoon, family get together. It's become more of a cultural thing. And that's what we need to realize and we need to emphasize this point to the people. Our whole lives need to revolve around Islam. Seriously, all our lives, from the moment you wake up to the moment we go to sleep. Everything, not just marriage, even the way we do our business dealings. And these are topics, you know, each topic requires a lot of detail. I did recently a talk in London, Deal or No Deal, Business Transactions in Islam. That was the title, by the way. Even our business transactions, sometimes some of us, we think Islam has got nothing to do with our business. Every part of our business transaction, there are rules of Islam attached. We need to learn about the laws of Islam in regards to business and trade before we can even do business and trade. Selling alcohol is an absolutely no-go area. That's the black and white of the rules of Islam. Absolutely, categorically forbidden, haram in Islam. For a Muslim to sell alcohol and make money, that money is filthy, it's absolutely dirty, it's haram. Anything purchased with it is haram. Any food you're eating, it's haram. Any food, seriously, any food you eat. You can eat vegetables, but if you've bought that vegetables through haram money, that vegetable is like pork. Seriously, I'm not joking. You know, this is, sometimes people, like they go into the shops and they look at the ingredients. And let's see, people get obsessed with some ingredients. E4962, let's look at the ingredients. They ask your brother, but the money you're going to take out from your pocket, right? That money, where is it? Is it haram income or haram? If it's haram, then it doesn't matter, E496. It's the same as just eating pork. It doesn't make a difference. Halal in Islam is not just ingredients. It's two things. The ingredients as well as the money used to purchase that item. If a husband is bringing in haram income, the ruling of Islam is that it's actually unlawful for the children and wife if they're practicing to actually eat from that money. It's actually, it's actually, I'm not... Uh, encouraging divorce, but it's actually a strong grounds for a woman to seek divorce. If because there's no financial support, and financial support means halal income. If the husband is not providing halal income, then the ruling is that she give a bit of time and say, look, you need to bring halal income, otherwise I'm going to seek a divorce. That's how important it is. So marriage is no different. Anyway, you come to the masjid, the khutbah. We need to realize what marriage is. We need to learn about marriage, like everything else. A few years ago, about five, six years ago, I gave a whole course, seven Sundays, from nine in the morning till six in the evening, the fiqh of marriage. This was in 2005, I think, or 2004, if I remember correctly. We, have, we had a whole seven-day course, A to Z of marriage. People before marrying, they need to learn about marriage. There are rules in Islam that we need to learn about. It's not just, okay, just get married just like that. There are rules, we need, to, we need to learn about marriage, like everything else. And even recently in London, just three, four months ago, or five months ago, I gave a condensed course of that same course. It was just four, four Saturdays. Once a month, I, I used to go to, to one of the colleges, the Brown Community College. And we did, we did three days, not just marriage, but one day we had three Saturdays, fiqh of marriage, the fiqh of marriage, and one day was the fiqh of divorce. There are rules of divorce that we also need to learn about. You know, so many times, you know, seriously, because I, I come across a lot of people. Now, people living in a haram relationship, divorce has taken place, but they don't realize. The one brother just recently, a few months ago, he realized that his marriage had ended 10 years ago, and he didn't even know that divorce took place. And then he realized that, oh, this is the ruling, this is the masala, this is the issue. Because in Islam, it is very easy. I don't want to scare you too much. Don't worry. It's the first time I'm here. What are you thinking? This guy is scaring you so much. But we need to realize. I mean, I just feel very strong about this. That we need to learn. So marriage as well. We need to, we need to take it as a religious thing. As a form of ibadah. Think about marriage. Learn about it. Why? What, what's happening? What's happening in the masjid? What's the wali? Who is the wali? Who's the guardian? You're marrying the sister. Or the sister marrying the brother. What's happening? The Imam recites three verses in the Khutbah al Hajj. Ya ayyuhal nasu taqwa rabbakum illa di khalaqakum min nafsu wahida wa khalaqa minha zawjaha wa batha minhuma rijalan kathira wa nisaf 
واتقوا الله الذي تساءلون به والارham ان الله كان عليكم رقيبا that's verse number one the second verse some of the imams here may have conducted marriage ceremonies يا ايها الذين امنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن الا وانتم مسلمون and the ayat of the third ayah يا ايها يا ايها الذين امنوا اتقوا الله وقولوا قولا سديدا يصلح لكم اعمالكم ويغفر لكم ذنوبكم ومن يطع الله ورسوله فقد فاز فوضا عظيما يعني لو ديت ام ام ذكر الحاسبين ان الكسان هي زي شوت وي ار اوريدي في افك بس وي ار كالتشرلي كامينج هير از اوف يو نو وات اي مين باي ذات عساد الله ابو رحمان عساد What time did you advertise the talk? He said 2 o'clock. I said, 2? That's a big mistake. If the talk is starting at 2, we need to advertise at 1. Then people might just turn up at 2 o'clock. Probably I'm the same as well, so... So, you know, it's just, we're all, we're all the same. Um, we need to have Muslim time in our life. What kind of time? Muslim time. Not Asian time, Muslim time. We're Muslims first before we're Asians. Or whatever we are. And Prophet Rahman is he's not even a nation. But we have different ethnicities. It doesn't matter. You know, we always talk about, am I British first or Muslim first? You know, this big issue. For us, we're Muslims first and foremost. And we're Muslims, that's it. Afterwards, it doesn't matter. We, we talk about whether I'm British first or Muslim first. But unfortunately, many of us are actually Indian or Pakistani or Bangladeshi first before we are Muslims. Many of us in our lifestyle, we are first Bangladeshi or a Pakistani or a Indian or an Arab or an African before we are Muslim. At that time, we don't talk about whether I am a Bangladeshi person or Muslim. It's only with Britain we talk about it. For us, we're Muslims first everywhere. Our Islam comes before our culture. I actually did a talk as well recently, a few months ago, I can't remember, in London. Uh, the deen and culture. It's on, it's, on, it's on the internet, you can see that whole series, it's that same recording up on YouTube or something. The deen and culture. What are those conflicts between Islam and culture, especially with regards to marriage? Marriage and divorce. I went through a series of issues. So the three verses of... Three verses which are recited in the marriage ceremony. No time to translate. But there's one... These three verses, if you look at these three verses of the Qur'an, of Surah Al-Nisa, and the other two verses, they don't even mention, they don't even have the mention of marriage in them. Imagine, the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, from the whole Qur'an, he could have chosen any verse. He could have chosen and selected any verse to recite at the time of marriage. There are many verses that talk about marriage. وَأَنْكِحُوا الْأَيَانَ مِنْكُمْ وَالصَّالِحِينَ مِنْ إِحْبَادِكُمْ وَإِمَائِكُمْ فَانْكِحُوا مَا طَابَ لَكُمْ مِنَ النِّسَاءِ مَثْنَا وَثُلَاثُ وَرْبَعُ Or verses, وَلَقَدْ عَرَسَلْنَا رُسُلًا مِنْ قَبْلِكَ وَجَعَلْنَا لَهُمْ أَزْوَاجًا Any verse to do with marriage could have been recited in the khutbah, the sermon of nikah and marriage. Yet the Messenger of Allah sallallahu chose chose to select three verses that do not even mention they got they have nothing to do with marriage well they have a lot to do with marriage which I, as i will explain but on the surface of it apparently these verses have nothing to do with marriage they don't even mention it guy these three verses is one thing in common you know what that is what's the word What's the word that's common in these three verses, somebody? Taqwa. You know what taqwa is? Taqwa is something that you can't really translate in English with one word. There are certain words in the Arabic language that you just can't translate them in any other language. To truly understand the true meaning of the word taqwa, you need to understand Arabic. You need to learn Arabic. But the closest you can... There are certain words in, in Arabic like fitna and taqwa and adab. You just cannot translate them with one word. Ihsan, it's a word. You just can't translate it. Taqwa, we say the fear of Allah. But it's the fear of Allah. It's the consciousness of, about Allah watching you, God consciousness. It's about the fact that basically in every step of an individual's life, he realizes or she realizes on every step of their life that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, their Lord and their Creator is watching them 
and they will be accountable. They will be responsible, they will be accountable in the next next life for everything they do or they say. That's the meaning of taqwa. Everything, every word, every statement that comes out from the mouth, every statement, any statement, verbal statement, or nowadays even anything you write. If a, this is what taqwa is. Taqwa is that a person, an individual, before saying anything, before writing anything, before you're making gestures, and before doing anything, any action, they realize, they understand that they will have to account for what they've said, or the gesture they've made, or they've written in the court of Allah in the next life. وَلِمَنْ خَافَ مَقَامَ رَبِّهِ جَنَّتَهِ وَأَمَّا مَنْ خَافَ مَقَامَ رَبِّهِ The one who fears standing before his Lord in the next life. This is what we need to think about throughout our life. Before every word that comes out from the mouth. If I'm talking to somebody, I need to think beforehand. And in the early times, the scholars used to actually do that, muraqaba. They used to actually go through that training of thinking beforehand. Imam al-Shafi'i radiallahu anhu, may Allah be peace with him, one of the great imams of his ummah, when someone used to come and speak to him, he would look down for a few seconds and then respond. He never used to just answer straight away. Somebody asked him, Oh Imam, why do you do that? Why does it take you like half a minute to respond? He said, Because so that I, I think for a moment whether it's better for me to respond and speak or remain quiet. And he would never speak, open his mouth unless he would realize the benefit in speaking. That's why silence. The hadith of the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam مَنْ كَانَ يُؤْمِنُ بِاللَّهِ وَالْيَوْمِ الْآخِرِ فَلْيَقُلْ خَيْرًا أَوْ لِيَصْمُدْ The one who believes in Allah on the final day, let him say that which is good or let him remain quiet. If we don't have anything good to say, then we should remain quiet. So this is taqwa. Even before we say anything, or we write. Writing as well. Now because we have the internet and on the forums, people are writing anything and everything. People are on different forums, you know, coming out as like, this is Zainab, maybe she's Abdullah really. He's Abdullah, but his username is Zainab. And this Aisha, username, I know probably his son, you know, Abdurrahman or Muhammad or something. And people slander and say, oh, and because of this internet phenomenon, that people think that they can get away with anything and everything. Because it's just them in front of the computer. If you have someone in front of you, you're probably scared or maybe shy or maybe embarrassed to say certain things, or maybe fearful that you might just get a punch. But on the internet, no, nothing's going to happen. So people just, he just say anything and everything. And nobody's going to realize who you are. But Allah is watching. In that room, in front of the screen, Allah is watching everything. And every letter that we type. And nowadays, we have phone, you know, internet on our, on our phones, you know, in our pockets. It's become even more easy. Technology, the more we advance in technology, the more easy it becomes to sin. Seriously, remember that. The more easier, before we never used to have mobile phones. Phones were at home. It wasn't that easy to commit sins over the phone. Now, when we had mobile phones, it became easier to commit sins. And now we have iPhones. It's become even more easier to commit sins. It's more easy because now you have everything in your pocket, all the apps. You know, everything's in the pocket. All the different apps that you want to go into. I was in California last week, in America. That's where the Apple, that's what I'm talking about, apps. Because, you know, uh, that's where the center of, of the whole industry of technology is. They, they in California, in LA, you think, well, that's everything. They've gone beyond iPhones. Everybody's got iPad down. You know, you have iPads. Do you know about iPads? So I was just telling them, I said, look, I'm away in England, we're just still quite excited about iPhones. You guys are much ahead in, in, in technology. But it's literally, it's every child. They have iPhones and iPads and all sorts. So the more we advance in technology, the more easy it becomes to sin. We should remember that. So this is this is what the word taqwa means. Now I want to relate this. Why did the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam chose to recite the three verses of taqwa? Why did he choose to discuss taqwa at the time of marriage? He should have talked about, you know, rights of the husband, rights of the wife, or talk about, you know, the love and mercy. You know, جَعَلَ بَيْنَكُمْ مَوَدَّةً وَرَحْمَةً Famous verse. 
that we have created love and mercy between the spouses or raising children or you know how to fulfill each other's rights no three verses of taqwa why the reason behind this especially at the time of marriage the recitation of the verses of taqwa the reminding of the person who's getting married of taqwa is because taqwa okay and i'm just going to use the term taqwa now i'll explain to you what taqwa is so no translation for it i'll just use the arabic and the quranic term taqwa taqwa is something that is required at all times in a person's life but especially and particularly at the time of marriage taqwa becomes absolutely essential taqwa we need to have this taqwa this this god consciousness that's probably the closest translation you can get this god consciousness not just at the time of marriage but we, they say before nikah taqwa qabla nikah taqwa inda nikah taqwa ba'da nikah if we have this quality this attribute this characteristic of taqwa before marriage at the time of marriage and after marriage specifically and particularly after marriage then we'll see that that marriage will be a marriage made in heaven it will be a blessed union it will be a blessed marriage but on the contrary if there is a lack of taqwa there is the absence of taqwa no matter how romantic you are how much you think that yes I'm a perfect wife or I am a perfect husband but if that marriage lacks taqwa that marriage is more or less doomed for failure seriously that marriage is more or less doomed for failure it's not going to work taqwa before marriage at the time of marriage and specifically particularly more importantly post marriage this god consciousness is absolutely essential and required before marriage is the stage these are three stages the stage before marriage is before a person gets married he needs to have a life of taqwa that doesn't mean that if a person did not have a life of taqwa then that's it their marriage is you know doomed no there's always you can repent we can repent the door is always open and that's why people who are not married if they've lived a life of sins then it is highly important that before marriage they make tawba they repent to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala they make their connection with Allah strong they clean their slates and then then enter marriage do not enter marriage with a slate full of sins because it's not it's going to be harmful it's not going to bring the barakah and the blessings in the marriage a marriage will be full of blessings and barakah if it started off on the right foot before marriage you need, we need to change our lives i've said to a lot of youngsters and look before you get married change even if it's a day before change your life change your but it's best to change beforehand at least a few months in advance at least a year in advance change your lifestyle change your ways because something that becomes a habit it remains even after your marriage you know habits sins which are form a habit and, and and there are people young people you see them that they have certain habits before marriage and they think you know what when I get married I'm going to sort all this out they still get involved in the same sins just by having a wife what's happened then they think probably this wife is not right for me so maybe I want to get married again this guy he tried two three four five wives he just he was never satisfied because he was living a life full of sins before and he had some specific problems and i don't want to go into the details of his problems but some specific bad habits and he thought that because i'm not married this is the reason why i have these habits and once i get married then i'm to be sorted but it carried on and it carries on and it carries on and you could be 40 you could be 50 you could be 60 you could be an old man and you'll have the same bad habits if somebody has a habit for example in his youth of of you know looking at lustfully at at the opposite gender especially specifically men looking at women in a lustful way because that's generally what happens and not the other way around that habit when it becomes engraved it remains despite you getting married it's not going to stop with marriage it'll carry on you can have 200 wives and still do the same not not that you can have to your wife but i'm just saying you can have you can have you know you can marry you can have children but that habit will remain so before marriage we need to really seriously before marriage change our ways this is very important taqwa before marriage starting off on the right foot 
clean your slate. Make tawbah and repent with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Start off on the right foot. Don't be involved in unlawful relationships. And that does not mean if somebody wants to marry someone who they were already in a relationship with, Islam allows it, of course, with our rules, etc. But it, it's allowed. But if you start off on the right, wrong foot, then it's not going to bring blessings and barakah in your marriage. It will, it won't. That doesn't mean that if they start off in a haram and lawful way, that's it forever. No. There's always a chance for Tawbah and repent. As soon as you realize you want to turn to Allah, you say, okay, that's it. We put a stop here. A lot of young people, when, you know, when they, when they talk to me, I say, look, if you want to marry her, you want to marry him, you can do. But from now, when you're speaking to me right now, you make a firm intention right now. That that's it. Any sort of unlawful interaction, any sort of unlawful interaction is seized and we will abstain, refrain from any sort of unlawful interaction from now, this moment. Not from tomorrow, right now. And make a tawbah from Allah. And then go through the right way, use the right channels, approach the family, and do the marriage, and you'll get the barakah and blessings. So it doesn't mean that if somebody did do things unlawfully, then it will always be, that marriage will always be doomed for, you know, failure. No, there's always ways of redeeming the situation. But before marriage, a taqwa, you start off in an Islamic way. If you want the barakah and blessings in your marriage, avoid a lawful haram relationship. Uh, avoid sins prior to marriage. Like for example, you know, and this is very common. People think when they're engaged, that they're, they're probably half married. That's what normal people think. That's what we think. Engagement is like, you're halfway there, now it's just a half, the way, a half left. Engagement, it's just, engagement is like engaged to marry. You can be engaged to do whatever. It just means that you fix, you just promised. If I promise to sell you this, Mulana Mufti Abdul Mahid, okay, if I promise to sell you this, I say, I'll sell you this after five days. Anything happen? I still have it. I still have it. Nothing's happened. It's just a promise. I might stay with that promise and I should maintain that promise, of course, as a Muslim, but um, I may act as a munafiq, may Allah save me, because going against one's promise is being a munafiq. Ayatul munafiq al And I may not sell it to you. It's actually ayatul munafiq al The signs of being a hypocrite. The Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says three. When you speak, you lie. When you make a promise, you break that promise. When you made a trustworthy person, you breach that trust. That's not a Muslim who does that, by the way. That's a munafiq, a hypocrite. In the words of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Engagement doesn't do anything. It doesn't change anything. You are still strangers. Complete strangers. Doesn't do nothing. Complete strangers. Doesn't change anything. No rules of Islam change. You can't start going out and, and remaining in seclusion, in privacy, going on a date. And that's why all the problems come later in the marriage. Because the marriage is number one, because we are disobeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We are violating the rules of Islam. That's number one. And number two, you know, a lot of people say, that we need to get to know one another even before engagement. You know, like a lot of times people say, how can you just get married without knowing one another? Seriously, you could try to date someone for one year, you'll still never get to know them. And it's actually more harmful. It's more harmful. Having long engagements and seeing one another frequently or infrequently every so often, that's actually more harmful and more disastrous to your future marital life than if you marry somebody. Of course you've investigated, researched and everything, but that's more disastrous. Seriously, it's more disastrous. Why? Because you know when you're, when you, when you're having that relationship, there's no commitment. You're seeing one another every so often, once a week, it feels really good. Because you just see, you know, you, your friend or whatever. Once a week, you're relaxed, he's relaxed, he's relaxed, it's fine. You're not talk, thinking about the pressures of life. You're not saying, okay, you know what, we need to go and get buy some napkins. You're not going to think about napkins, are you, right now? You need to go to Asda, Tesco. You know what, I need some baby wipes and some napkins and get this. No, 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 that. It's just going out to eat in a restaurant. She's like really put makeup on and she's dressed for the occasion and you just make sure you put all the perfume just before you came. And it was smell nice. That 
kind of setup doesn't remain forever. You could be like that for one year, but when you get married and the reality sets in and you start living with one another and you have the daily chores of life, responsibilities, you have children coming, you have to look for a house, you have to look for work, job, it's a, it's, it's, then it becomes difficult. And then they think, oh, this is, this is, this, I can't take this anymore. It was, it was really good before, of course, because you weren't living together. And that's why a lot of times there's actually more cases where so-called love marriages, even though I call them lust marriages, they're not love marriages, but so-called love marriages end up in divorce than arranged marriages. I personally experience more people I have seen, personally, more people I know from a percentage point of view. I know more marriages, more, the divorces that have taken place, more of them, and majority of them were so-called love marriages when they wanted to marry themselves. I ended up in divorce. I know young people, like I remember speaking to, this is a long time ago, there was a sister I remember speaking to three, four years ago, and she was young, and, and her, the brother she wanted to marry, and the parents, like her parents were not really up for the idea, and she wanted to know whether she can do a secret marriage, or a secret nikah, or this, and you know, all these things, subhanAllah, it's just, it's just ridiculous. And she wanted to know, yeah, there are genuine cases, I've actually talked about this, so there are genuine cases where parents are difficult. I've actually given a lot of talks to the parents. Where parents are difficult, they don't make it easy for our young people, and maybe I'll just talk about that further along, but let me not go there now. But here, she wanted to marry someone, and, and, they, and even the brother spoke to me afterwards, she got him to talk to me, and then, you know, they wanted to know the Islamic ruling, and I was trying to help them, I said, okay, if you want to get married, maybe you get married. But anyway, the point, that she, when she was talking to me, as she was speaking as though, that person, that's it, for her in the world, there's nobody. I can't live a life without him. That's, for me, I, I would die if I don't marry him. You know what, after eight months, She'll probably die if she sees his face. <laughs> Seriously, that's what happened after eight, nine months. She said, I just hate the sight. I just don't want to see. Even thinking about it makes me really angry. What happened? Eight months? What happened? That's happened. Two opposites. Complete change. This, this, this tells us something. This tells us something. So start off on the right foot. Marriage needs to be, you know, before marriage, taqwa. God consciousness, being a practicing Muslim, bring, being a practicing Muslim, Muslim, being a, a devout, righteous believer, being spiritual, being close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, being a practicing Muslim and a Muslim, a practicing believing man and a practicing believing woman, and then you start your marriage, you enter marriage. That doesn't mean if somebody thinks that, you know what, well, I'm going to find six years, let me do all the sins, and, you know, and then after five years, I'll start being righteous and then get married. No, that's not how it works. Because life, we don't know. Anytime, death can come anytime. And you see that even if death comes later, the more you become um, accustomed to a life of sins, the more it becomes difficult for you to come back on the right path. Do you this point? The more you become accustomed. If you spend another five years of a life of sins, that it'll take you the double time for you, or maybe, maybe not, but it'll, it'll be more of a struggle to become a righteous practicing Muslim. So therefore to say, I'll wait for another three years, let me just enjoy life, it's just going to make the matter more difficult for you, because now the habit has set in, the lifestyle is different. The lifestyle is different. For you to, you know, you move to another area for you to get, if I move here to Newcastle, maybe it'll take me ten years, Sorry, I'm probably just a day to maybe get accustomed to, to the city. You know, you go to a new place and you know, you're trying to get to know people, you don't like it, you feel homesick. This is the same. If someone uh, spends a lifetime of sins and then for them to become practicing, it's, it's difficult. A few days, it's just, you have to struggle with shaitan, with, with your nafs, with your soul, and it becomes difficult. So therefore, don't wait straight away. We need to change. This is taqwa before marriage, and this is having um, the, 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 the God consciousness before marriage. And then number two, taqwa in the nikah, at the time of marriage. Taqwa at the time of marriage. Before marriage, God consciousness. At the time of marriage, subhanAllah, it's very important. What do I mean by taqwa at the time of marriage? Every part of our marital ceremonies, 
our marriage ceremonies, every part of it, A to Z of it, you can have something culturally then, no problem, as long as it does not go against Islam. But every part of it must be strictly in accordance with the teachings and guidance of the Quran and Sunnah and the guidance given by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and His Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. In order for our marriages to be prosperous, in order for you to have a prosperous marriage, for you to have a lifetime of peace and tranquility, that doesn't mean that you have no difficulties ever in your life. This life is full of challenges and trials and tribulations without a doubt. But if you want that inner peace and you want that inner tranquility and you want a life, a marriage of peace and tranquility and a marriage as described by the Quran, وَجَعَلَ بَيْنَكُمْ مَوَدَّةً وَرَحْمَةً marriage becomes a source of mercy and love, then you must ensure that that marriage is in accordance with the sunnah of the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. This is taqwa at the time of marriage. Unfortunately, we again in our communities and cultures, we have all the lists, all the sins that you could put up on a list are carried out at the time of marriage. And then when marriages end in failure, we don't have the barakah, we don't have the blessings, you know, we start complaining. فَلَا يَلُمَنَّ إِلَّا نَفْسًا Nobody is, you know, worthy of, to blame. We should be blaming our own selves. Don't blame anyone else except our own selves. Because the marriages, we did not conduct them. We did not carry them out in accordance with the teachings of the Quran and Sunnah. Everything. Make marriages easy. Make them simple. In the a'adham al-nikahi barakatan aysaluhu mu'na. The Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says that the marriage, that marriage, which has the least expenditure, the easiest marriage, the most simplest of marriages, those are the ones that receive the most barakah and blessings from Allah. It's a simple thing. You know, we've unfortunately, brothers and sisters, this is an important point. Unfortunately, we have made marriages difficult. Islam considers marriage to be a very simple activity. A simple activity. Don't t- understand this in a wrong way. I'm not trying to say certain things, but but it should be simple. Islam considers marriage to be an extremely simple, simple activity in your lifestyle, in your lifetime. It's a very simple activity. We have placed restrictions upon ourselves, self-imposed shuruq and conditions and restrictions. That this person has to come, and that person has to come, and this hole needs to be hired, and this much money. Even if we don't have the money, we'll take a loan out. And just because of cultural reasons, because what would people say in the community? The worst thing a believer can do is think about what people will say. You know what? It's just going to make your own life miserable. It's actually one of the best ingredients. There's actually a whole list of ingredients. I gave it to recently where I mentioned eight or seven steps of happiness in life. And one of the steps, I mentioned seven, went through seven steps, to be happy in life, to have that inner peace and tranquility. And one of the steps was this, don't think about what people will say. If you, you know, uh, block your mind, and you just blank it, you know, to complain, what people will say, you don't think about what people, you don't don't bother in the least. Yes, you are bothered about what Allah will think about you, or the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam think about you. You you only fear Allah and you only think about you. As long as your relationship with your Lord is clean, you're not violating any rules of Islam, then don't think about people. Because you know the world, the people, nobody, there's never a time where people will be happy. They'll be happy with one day, next day they'll be upset. Our, our, Our objective in life is not to make people happy. And we were never able to make people happy. Never. You could be the most righteous individual in the world. It's still, and there's never, it's not going to happen. It's not going to happen. So, when we do marriages, don't think about this, they will say this, and she will say this, and who will say what, and what will... That's the problem. We have imposed restrictions, conditions, until I don't have a mansion, I don't, uh, until I don't have, until you don't have a car, until like I know, I know this brother, this is Palestinian brother once, I mean, he was sitting in Syria a long time ago, um, he used to, you know, he's a good friend of mine, he used to say that, you know, it's so difficult here in Arab world for me to get married. No parents will give me their daughter until I don't have three keys. I said, what are those three keys? He said, key to a business, key to a home, and key to a car. I said, thank, I'm not in your community. 
It's difficult. You know, huge amounts of dowry. I'm not saying don't fix dowry if you can. But Islam makes, says marriages are very simple. To the point that the companions, radiallahu anhu, they would marry like, you know, they would just go and eat somewhere. That's how simple it is. Abdurrahman ibn Awf, radiallahu anhu, the Sahabi. The Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa saw him like after a week and he had a yellow stain on his white clothing. So he said, Ya Abdurrahman, what is this yellow stain? Mahadin Sufra, what's this yellow stain on your clothes? He said, Oh, yeah, Messenger of Allah said, last week I got married, so you know I applied some perfume on the white, so that is from the, the, the perfume that I applied. So oh, you got married. Barakallah, may Allah bless you. Awli walobi shatin. Don't forget, just make a small walima, even if it's just by slaughtering just one goat. Don't worry. If it was someone like me, I'm the Imam, Astaghfirullah, you didn't even tell me, you know, you didn't even call me. You forgot me. This is the messenger of Allah. Imagine. He did not even feel the need to inform the messenger of Allah. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Does he inform him all the time he eats food? No. Even though it's a once in a lifetime, but still it's an easy thing. It's, it's something that we need to try to make it as simple. Especially abstain from sins. The intermingling of the genders in an unlawful manner where dancing takes place, people are dressed in inappropriate ways, inappropriate manners, unlawful haram music is played, and there's just all the sins you can think of, rather than the two people who are marrying, another 20 people are getting married. Do you know what I mean by that? These two are marrying, and everybody else comes to check out all the girls and boys in the inner marriage ceremony. Yes, the young people. Why do they go to marriages? To check out the girls, and the girls to check out the boys. And we, this, this, this is totally haram activity. And we become the people who are marrying, the means of not just blessings and barakah going away from our marriage, but we are a means of other people sinning. So taqwa at the time. Taqwa at the time of marriage. The Imam is reciting the verse of the Qur'an, Ya ayyuhal nas, Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu taqullah, fear Allah. You've come to the mosque right now, to do, you know, we go to the masjid and the imams are reading the khutbah and the verse and I'm sitting there, you know, like the guys getting married and he's sitting there and he says, Oh, you will believe, fear Allah. And you're thinking, yes. And straight after that, after the mosque, straight into the hall and all the sins. Yeah, you just, you were just told to fear Allah. And in 10 minutes you're saying, you know, you know what, I don't want to fear you, I'm going to disobey you. But this is the reality. The imam three times said, fear Allah, fear Allah, fear Allah. And with all the fear of Allah, we go back and commit all the sins. Anyway, the time is short, so I'm going to paste it. The main part I really want you to talk about was the last stage, the final stage. Because it's for everyone, those who are not married and the ones who are married. The, the stage, the last stage, final stage is very important. Which is taqwa after marriage. Allah, it is so important. In order for a marriage to last. And before I mention this, also doesn't mean that whenever a marriage does not last, doesn't mean that people did not have taqwa. We should also remember that as well. Because marriages can end. Even the prophets divorce their wives. Marriages can end. Divorces can take place. Sometimes you have two people who are the most righteous. You know, you don't even have to have anyone at fault. This is another talk, another topic. It's not for today, but when we talk about the concept of divorce in Islam, that it should be easy divorce, it should be done with, with, uh, in an amicable manner, with good understanding and departing on, on the best of ways. Even two people who are the most righteous of individuals in the world, they could end up in divorce. Even prophets have divorced their wives. Maybe there's no compatibility, there's no chemistry, it's okay. You could have the Imam al al Baghdadi of the time, the Rabi al Basariya, the great pipe of the time marrying and divorce takes place. So don't, this doesn't mean that whenever divorce takes place, the people they didn't have taqwa. But normally, in order to have a blissful marital relationship, in order to have peace and tranquility at home, in order to have that inner peace, tamanila, sukun, itmi'nan al like Allah says, Allah bin Dhikr Allah, The most important factor is that once you marry from day, Seven from day one. Not after one year. Not that okay, you know what's the honeymoon period? Just chill out for a year or so, you know, you and your wife go first night, you and your husband going for a honeymoon and doing haram things. It's, it's 
just a word like that. From day one, post marriage starts, the moment you said in the mosque, you know, you did you did the ijab and qabul, the offer and acceptance, the woman did the offer and the man said, Qabil tuha, the zawaj tuha na kahsura. From that moment onwards. That day and then the first night, and then the first second day, and the second night, and the third day, and the third night, until death do you part. Okay, death will do you part just for maybe just a short period, and then you're back together again in the next life, inshallah. But taqwa, the fear of Allah, God consciousness, and that's why when a person is seeking and looking for a potential spouse, if you want a happy marriage, sisters and brothers, when you select the criteria, is someone who has taqwa. When you're looking for a sister to get married to somebody who's not married here, okay, search for a sister who has the first and foremost, the attribute of taqwa. Sisters as well, when you're searching and looking for a brother to get married to, the first attribute you need to consider is taqwa, the fear of Allah. Because only taqwa, especially the person is being reminded of the marriage. Because now, it's difficult. Until now, you were living as a bachelor. You were living on your own. There were no responsibilities. There were no duties. You know, you could just come home anytime you want. More or less, you could do whatever you want, anytime. You're not attached. You could do whatever, you just... As I say, young, free and single. But, you know, you are, you are free. Now it's difficult. And the only way you are able to survive that difficulty is with the fear of Allah. Taqwa. It's difficult. Your wife might say something, you might not like it. But you think, you know what? Um, I, Allah, you know, I need to fear Allah. I don't want to talk back. The, the wife as well, she thinks. Before, you know, talking away, she thinks. Every word, that's why the definition, what did I say? Every word that comes out from the mouth. You know what? Allah will ask me. If, if I swear and slander and swear to my husband, if I say something negative to him, Allah will ask me. In the akhirah, Allah will ask you as a wife. Allah will ask you as a husband. Did you treat your wife well? There's nothing that's going to prevent anyone from being a ungrateful and, and, and a person who is an oppressor. We talk about all these things, laws and principles and domestic violence, all of that. But ultimately it boils down to one thing. You can have all the rules and everything. We can have conferences, and I've attended myself conferences, on domestic violence and physical abuse and emotional abuse and mental abuse and whatever. You can have everything and have that. But ultimately it goes back to the fear of Allah. Nothing will prevent the person. You could educate the person, anything and everything, but as long as that person does not have the fear of Allah, it's going to be difficult. If they have this fear of Allah, God consciousness, before being angry, the husband, before being angry and rage, he'll be a righteous Muslim. He'll have worked on his heart. He would have got himself rid of the spiritual diseases like jealousy, like hatred, and anger, and pride. And the wife as well. And when I say taqwa as well, actually, in one of the talks I mentioned that it ultimately boils down to the purification of the soul and the purification of the heart. That, that's what it ultimately boils down to. All these diseases, spiritual diseases, when you're looking for a spouse, look for a wife or a husband who has worked on their heart. Tazkiyatul qalb which is an important part of the teaching of the Qur'an and Sunnah. قَدْ أَفْلَحَ مَنْ زَكَّاهَ وَقَدْ خَابَ مَنْ دَسَّاهَ Allah says in the Qur'an, the one who's purified this soul heart, أَفْلَحَ He has achieved success, salvation in this life and the next life. يَوْمَ لَا يَنْفَعُ مَالٌ وَلَا بَنُونٌ إِلَّا مَنَ تَاللَّهَ بِقَلْبٍ سَلِيمٌ On the day of judgment, nothing will benefit us except the one who comes to Allah with a sound heart. The Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, there's a piece of flesh in the body, mudra. If that's sound, everything else is sound. Your whole marital life is sound. If that's diseased, if that's bad and corrupted, then everything around you is corrupted. And that's why we have books on this topic. We have these, you know, diseases. We have blameworthy character traits. The spiritual diseases, 
considered to be the radha'il. We have the fadha'il, and we have the radha'il. The radha'il, jam'u radhilati, the plural of the word radhila, which means a spiritual disease. It's a blameworthy character trait, like anger, like jealousy, like uh, vanity, like um, ostentation, showing off, like um, um, hatred and enmity and love of the dunya, love of the world. Someone who's worked on these things, in order to get taqwa, you need to work on these things. Before marriage, when you find a wife, for example, right, who uh, has the disease of jealousy, then you have a problem in a marriage. Every time something happens, she's jealous. Oh, oh look, look, look at my friend, her husband bought her this, and you can't get me this. Or she, for example, she has love for the dunya. The Messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, in one hadith of Surah al Majah, he said, search for a wife, and to the less. Doesn't make big demands. She doesn't say you have a book with this and every time you go to shopping she always wants shoes and handbags but that it's a bad thing buy it but with, with moderation love of dunya spiritual disease if, if it's a wife who thinks who knows and realizes the, the trivial nature of this world she knows it's only 60-50 years she doesn't expect anything from anyone she knows her real duty is her lord and her creator Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala she's a pious righteous muslim then seriously, as a husband, you have the best of wives in the world. That's why, Don't look at the beauty, don't look... I mean, that you can consider it to an extent, right? To an extent, because attraction is important as well, because one of the objectives of marriage is to fulfill your desires. But ultimately, the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, The one of deen, the one of taqwa, the one of the purification of the heart. Likewise, women, sisters looking for husbands, if you have a husband who has a spiritual disease of anger and rage, your marriage will end in about six months. I have so many divorce cases. So many. So many over the years. And most of them, the, the guy just gets angry and he loses it. And he just says the word divorce, talaq, and whatever. People utter statements of kufr. Seriously. When they get angry, when they rage, they utter and pronounce Statements of kufr. Oh, I don't, I hate Allah. Oh, the they say things like that. People get angry, they don't realize. Statements of kufr sometimes ends marriages. So you have a husband who doesn't fear Allah. He doesn't fear Allah. He's not God conscious. He does not realize the fact that anger is a spiritual disease. It's a sinful act. One of the worst of sins that a person can commit. You're going to have a problem. You need a husband who, is, who has a fear of Allah. He is righteous, who is pious. After marriage, if you have a husband who is not angry, he doesn't have love of dunya, he's not a jealous individual, he's not proud, he's not arrogant, he doesn't have vanity, he has zuhudi. These are spiritual diseases. And he's replaced them with the praiseworthy character traits. The fadha'il, the radha'il, the blameworthy character traits. He's replaced them with with tawadu, with, with, uh, with what? Um, Humbleness and humility. He's not, he's not proud. He's not proud. He, he will respect his wife. He'll look after her. He'll be gentle. He'll be considerate. He'll be kind. Because he's, he's you know, mutawadah. He's symbol, someone who's humble. He doesn't have jealousy. He doesn't have hatred. He doesn't have enmity. He doesn't have love of dunya in the heart. All these diseases are gone and he's replaced them with sabah, patience. Sabah is a praiseworthy character trait. So if the wife does something which he doesn't like, he'll be able to exercise that suffering and patience. He'll be able to have control over himself. Say, so, okay, she's saying that right now, but in about 10 minutes, she'll be okay. Like, you know, husbands know that your wife might say something, she doesn't really need it, okay, the lights, just overlook it. She's probably really angry right now, but after two hours, she's like, you know, sorry, I didn't need it. I need that, you didn't this happens. But these are things, you know, um, in, a, in a marital relationship. Taqwa, the fear of Allah, post-marriage. So anyway, I'm going to end here. We need taqwa in order for our marriage to be prosperous. In order for the marriage to be blessed and a blessed union of marriage. What's the title? What was it? Blessed union of marriage. In order for the union to be blessed. What do we take away with this today? We need to remember. A taqwa, the fear of Allah, God consciousness, before marriage, at the time of marriage, 
and in particular after marriage inshallah. Jazakallah khair for listening and I'm going to talk about the Quran and the Quran. So Allah is salam ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala Alaihi Wasallam. Hmm.